where I finally reached. Because your word of mouth is very, very slow, but it's very positive, very, uh, very mm. sure that if somebody's got a problem, you cured them, then she tells 100 people that this is what happened. This is where I am. So I really believed in word of mouth. I'm against publicity. And to date, it's 42 years, my company, I've never, never, never advertised. And that's why I lecture of the world of how to create a brand without publicity. I started by borrowing 3,000 US dollars. It was um, recently the market value of Shana's was given as 1 billion plus. So finally, I did arrive. How did your husband and the rest of your family feel as you started on this journey? And did it change the fact that you were, at that point, a young mother, uh, a female launching an entrepreneurship at the time you did? It wasn't easy. My husband was very great. He sort of helped me a lot because he knew that, you see, I made it very clear in the beginning that uh, I'm walking this path. The fact that I got married doesn't mean that you know I need to answer a situation. If I, as a mother and as a wife and as a daughter, are not doing my duty, I'm fine. But if everybody's happy, but they still insist that I should uh, hit the beaten track as a wife, that's wrong. You're born alone, you live alone, you die alone. If somebody holds your hand on the way, good, and they must love you for it, let you go. But if they insist that you must do what they say, I think that's not necessary. You should do what you think is good for yourself. And that, uh, I'm sure my husband got clear. So even if he stopped me, I still wouldn't listen. That's right. for sure. So then what's the point of stopping him? <laughs> <laughs> you stop a person if they won't listen. You know, if he said, don't go, I still go. If he said, don't jump into the well, I still jump. So stopping, they knew that this, she's a, you know, uh, <laughs> one track horse, she would never stop. <laughs> and even if, you know, what, what happened? Suppose he said, okay, I'm divorcing you, letting you go. You know, at one point, my uh, situation came that I would take the baby away. I had very tough in-laws. I said, fine. Uh, I was given the message by someone that, you know, you won't have your family so long. I said, doesn't matter. Then I have, I have family later on, more children, no problem. But my life can't stop. You live one life and you live it well lived. And you don't answer anybody but yourself. If in the uh, conscience and in your mind you're sure you're doing right, then nothing can stop you. But beyond that, I think no part in the world should ever stop a woman by her doing what she thinks is best for herself. Most important is she must answer to herself. No one in the world, no one has a right to tell a woman ever, do this, do that. Why? There's no one has given anybody the right. A man and a woman are the same as far as their uh, values are concerned, as far as their rights are concerned. started um, your first salon, then what happened next? How did you go from having one salon to having, I mean, literally, when I go to India, Shanaz is everywhere. The brand is everywhere. I use Shanaz Gold. Like, it's everywhere. So how did it go from being in one salon and you doing it to it becoming a scaled business? I think you should have a separate uh, department in MIT. And maybe I can come once a year to lecture in MIT. How to create a brand without publicity. It's really I'm very hard to say that. I don't know why the billions of dollars are spent in publicity. Because you know, suppose I advertise a moisturizer, Shah Moist. It's my hottest seller. And say, use Shah Moist, it's good. If it's good, you'll buy it. But it's not good, no matter how much money I pump in, it will not be there. <clears throat> Your value of the ad is as um, powerful as that time you see it for that moment. Tomorrow morning is a bigger ad of another product, maybe the same product in another form. So I don't think that, how can an ad help? If I say it's good and it's not good, you throw it away. But if your best friend says, try it, it's miracles, fabulous, then what happens? So what really ha matters is the quality of the product, not the ad that goes behind it. What's the use? So many huge multi-billion dollar um, ads come in the pro with the product and the product disappears, you don't know where it went. I don't think the ad is really important. The cosmetic empire is pumping billions of dollars into a hysterically mad cosmetic industry, selling youth and dreams in bottle jars. There, I thought, they're selling chemicals, no good, the whole world is selling chemicals. I sold a civilization in a jar. I sold 3,000 years of India's heritage in one jar. <laughs> you know, the cosmetic buyer of Selfridges told me there's a princess, a very big problem with your product. She didn't sound very happy, but I was. She said that if somebody comes for louder and is not available, give them to you and they're happy. We give them 
uh, uh, YSL and they are very happy. But somebody comes from Shainaz, they go back and come back, there is no second. That is the USP of Shainaz. Why? If we have an anti-aging Shah life, we have a problem for uh, hair, a special problem, cleanser. We have uh, under eye, we have uh, skin care, we have body care, we have scars, we have anti-wrinkle, all made from plants. And the plants are based 3000 BC by way of knowledge, but what I have done is put in the latest advancements in skin science. If uh, tomorrow America or UK or US says that so and so product, jojoba is good or any cactus good, whatever, I add that also so it becomes in hope. Mm. If women look around for the latest product, so it becomes something that everybody would accept. It is not easy because it is a very, very cutthroat, fierce market cosmetics. But uh, to survive there, I do not know whether you will know, but I, I think you will have a photocopy in your uh, file that one client walked in in August this year and British lady and brought cosmetics worth 4,334 4, pounds, one woman. The cosmetic buyer objected, she said, I am scared, it will finish. So tell me which product can sell for a single product that much just by the power of effectivity. An ad wouldn't get you 4,000 pounds, that's about I think 8,000 US. So really the product quality is important, not the ad. I think all the ad companies will pack up, but anyway, the what is used is saying is good. If it's good, it will show, you know, if it's a shampoo or skin or whatever, body care. What's the use of an ad word? You know, it's nice to inform maybe by way, what you should really do, anybody who launches a product, anyone of you goes into your careers, wants to launch a product. What I did do, what I, and I must say that for you to remember is, the moment I opened a salon, I called the press. And that's what my little mind thinking when I was 15 or 16, I thought if I call the press, they'll write about me. So then became the story of Shanaz. So everybody wrote that I met her and this is what she said, and I met her and this is what she said. Now, People love to read the story of a person, the product behind it, and what she says it does. And oh, I have a bald patch that might help. My hair is falling. She says this will help. My my skin is bad. I've got acne or pimples. This will help. And then people started coming back. And and the another thing that is very different I did was I wasn't selling a shampoo or a product or cream. I sold prescriptions. You know, Ayurveda morning this, afternoon this, night this. Morning this, after this night. For hair it was shampoo, apply whenever washing, tonic daily every day and then um, uh, hair serum whenever uh, skin f or hair feels dry. So it was, everyone wrote a prescription on Shainaz. Then we opened schools mm. to train people to write prescriptions. So the beauty school started. Now in, I think within India we have about 8,000 schools. Then I was very concerned about India. I thought there were little girls, very clever, intelligent girls, married early, 14, 15, 16, lots of babies, nothing to do, very bored, very brilliant, very intelligent, very rich family housewives are not very rich. But nothing to do because they weren't educated. So I went on a lecture program and told girls to refuse to get married unless you have a technical education. Just say, no, I'm not getting married. Unless your parents give you technical education, don't get married, number one. Number two, if you're married and you have nothing to do, then open a salon in the house. So I started a system of women opening salons the house. And so there was no rent. There was no problem, the wife going out, you know, husbands or mother-in-law saying, oh, we go out is bad or whatever. So in the house they were earning money and then I said earn money in the house and then buy a shop or then rent a shop. So they're earning themselves to becoming bigger. And that became a worldwide movement and uh, starting from Delhi and all over India. And then became the largest, uh, was sent for the Guinness Book of Records, the largest herbal chain of its kind in the world. So there was no looking back. <laughs> you know an entrepreneur never looks back and A, most important, more than uh, looking back, never gives up. I'll never give up. If I make up my mind to do something, I don't think I should say God, but nothing can stop me. <laughs> uh, how, how can anything stop me? I've made up my mind. But remember, if there's a wall. There's a method of walking through. If I'm walking and I see a wall, I'll never turn back. I'll make my door and walk through and let the world fall into place. In the U.S., one of the things that's fascinating, in the U.S., women spend millions of dollars to darken their skin, while in India, ads, the same kind of ads for chemical products, advertise for women to lighten their skin. So how do you see um, this advertising push for women to want to look or be different? And, and how do you think your products address or counter that? 
No, it's a very difficult situation. I created a product called Fair One, which became one of the hottest sellers in India for fairness of skin. Well, fairness for clearing the skin. The problem is that if you see the papers, it says wanted a fair bride. It's one of the main, main um, assets they're looking for is color. It's nothing, nothing to do with India, really. It's the culture of several centuries coming down that a girl is fair, she's beautiful. In your part of the world, you want to get dark. So uh, the, the culture of fairness is ingrained over the years that a fair girl is beautiful. But beyond that, I think there's nothing to be concerned about because I think the color is not important. The quality of the skin is important. The color of the hair is not important. The quality is important. But I think now India is changing. I think, don't think fairness is all that great. But there is a great concern that if the girl is fair, she's beautiful. So I don't think that should worry anymore. It's changing now. The cream that I created was called Fair One. But what, why, you know, you say that I'm talking against fairness and fairness is not important. But what I saw was, and the reason why I made this product was, A, the fairness cream is very expensive. This one is very cheap. Maybe. It was half a dollar, or maybe one dollar, mass market. And the second was that um, they were using very powerful chemicals to whiten the skin, damaging the kidneys. I knew the hydroquinone and things like that. I said suicide. Uh, the mm -hmm. Time magazine has a huge article once I read that thousands of people all over the world would die of kidney failure and sleep and still color the, you know, their skin or hair with detergents or chemicals that are bad. So I thought, okay, then I mix the same thing from plants, so there are no side effects. Mm -hmm. That's where the story of fairness with plants started. Thank you. I think we'll open it up. Um, I'm sure people in the audience have questions. So, um, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, I'm curious, what would you say, what would you say is either your biggest regret or the worst mistake that, I mean, that you've made either, you know, business-wise, but specifically on your road from, you know, a young teenager starting their own business and education to where you are now, what is the one thing that you look back on and said, I wish I hadn't done that, or I wish I did this differently? Well, I think the biggest mistake I made was that I was offered about Ten years ago, uh, a very huge marketing company wanted to take uh, the product uh, worldwide marketing. You see, I am uh, actually a chemist. I am specializing in treatments and cures from plants. I am not a marketing person at all. And the, the situation is that I am not really keen that the whole world know about me. They would finally know about the product as time goes on. And that kind of publicity took 43 years. So my, I think, greatest mistake was that when I was offered this um, chance to go worldwide marketing, at that time I said no. I thought that, you know, I thought that you know, even now I think that, you know, if somebody takes my product and mass markets it, then that, you know, it's a product which requires uh, consultation and care. So, you know, it become a sort of a money-making machine and would lose the uh, spiritual touch that I've given it as an individual. But I think now I've made up my mind that if uh, I get the right marketing uh, tool, I would let them mass market it worldwide. We have several companies. Every day we have people from all the world saying that we want to invest in China, we want to market. But I'll be very careful. I have to give it the right person so don't make a mistake. So sign a sort of blunder. I want to be careful. But I will now. That was the blunder I made. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, you know the compared you to the black swan of Nassim Tali, and you were the black swan for politicians and bureaucrats. 